Hi all, welcome to a very special, initially unscheduled episode of Dialogue Options. The series is technically in hiatus, but when I got the opportunity to interview James Damore, I couldn't turn it down. So what you're about to see is an in-depth, highly substantive discussion between two hopefully smart individuals. Now, James is a very introverted and polite guy. So he was so introverted and polite that he did not mention that my camera froze about five minutes into the interview. So when I disappear from the picture in a picture format, that's why. And I'm saying this for a very specific reason. This interview is edited for technical reasons only. If you see any cuts in the video, it is only to eliminate video lag so that James's uh, image matches up with his audio. I did that because prior interviews that James has done have utilized editing techniques that changed the meaning and the tone of what he had said and I wanted to be very very careful not to do that so no content specifically no audio content has been removed from this interview the edits are cosmetic only so with that caveat I only have one more thing to say if you like what you see please click the patreon link below this video. The support is greatly appreciated. Hopefully if I get enough patrons, I can get better equipment and overcome these technical issues. So without further ado, here's my interview with James Damore. Hey everybody, Dialogue Options returns with a very special episode. I know I say that every time, but this one's for real. I'm here with the Google guy, and I bet he hates being called that. James Damore. James, welcome to Dialogue Options. Thanks, it's great to be here. All right, so we're not going to focus today, guys, on the scandal. We're not going to get into the legal stuff. We're not going to be all, oh, go go that way. I don't want to politicize it because you guys know me. I'm a very atypical female, and that's why I was so interested in talking here, that I'm an ideas per. I'm a, I'm a things person. I'm not a people person, so I'm really, really interested in this. Um, and uh, what we're going to do today is try to get into what your actual message and views are, James. Get a better sense of your ac actual point of view. Um, now, I apologize in advance if some of my questions seem totally off base, because one of the reasons I want to talk to you is I feel like I'm completely lacking context for mm -hmm. the document you sent. Um, so I want to start with sort of the basics. My understanding, tell me if I'm wrong. You went to a diversity workshop. Right. And the document, I'm not going to call it a manifesto because you're right, it's so much not. Um, the document you sent was a response to that diversity workshop. Right. It, they solicited feedback. Right. And then I sent it to them. Now, what was the workshop about? Was it specifically about women? It was about diversity and inclusion in general at Google. So it, it addressed women, but also just general diversity and demographics. And it tried to touch a little bit on just uh, other aspects of diversity. Right. So, but, so it was an optional workshop, right? Uh, yeah, so it was uh, highly suggested for the, you know, coming up or the high level people within my organization. Okay, so you, were, are you man were you management here? No, I, I'm i not management yet, but I was at a point where I could become one very soon. Okay, so you were doing this as a sort of career development exercise. Yeah, and I mean, I was actually just very interested in the subject and inclusion in general. Okay, that, good. Because I, I saw a lot of issues with inclusion. Right, that's, that's the sense I get, that you went out of a sincere interest, not to sort of hate watch the whole thing, right? Right. <laughs> right. Okay, good. That's important to establish because I think that what comes next is important because, you know, my next question is, you know, that's the thing. I don't go to these workshops because I teach these workshops at the college level. And so I know sort of firsthand, um, 
most of these things just preach platitudes. They're not actually offering viable solutions. So why go if it's optional? Uh, for me? I mean, yeah. I, I wanted to discuss it. So it was, you know, a whole day thing. So I thought that it would really provide ways of, or tools to increase the inclusivity of my team. That was my short-term goal of, you know, I saw some issues where, you know, there were some people that were neuroatypical, you know, on my team. And oh, you jumped to one of my questions. Good. You're answering <laughs> it for me. Okay. And, you know, I'm sort of socially awkward myself, so I didn't really know how to include them in team lunches and stuff and how to encourage people to speak up in meetings. You know, we have some assertive people on the team and, you know, there are many people that just don't speak at all. And so we're, we were missing their voices in me team meetings. Okay. That, that provides some context. That's really, because I said to my patrons, send me questions for James. And one of the questions was about neuroatypicality and, and autism in the workplace. So that's very interesting that you brought it up on your own. My next question for you is when you submitted your document and it was resoundingly ignored, you know, right. why not just you, you know, I've been in this situation, you have profound disagreements with the company. They're not especially, um, interested you're a smart guy you're clearly highly skilled you're clearly very good at what you do why not just find somewhere else like just go who needs them and and move on move on to a different company or different programs within the company well either or like why not just get away from that particular team uh well so i did go to multiple of these programs and i i discussed a lot of the same issues and actually sent this as feedback to those programs too and did you get a more positive result previously? Uh, so, you know, it was generally ignored by the administrators of the programs, but I was able to start one-on-one -on -one conversations with uh, some of the participants. And those participants also shared it with some people that I also got some really constructive feedback on. Okay, so you've had more positive experiences with this kind of exercise before. Right. And then at some point I was suggested by a high level manager to actually, you know, create an, my own discussion group for this and uh, try to broaden the discussion. Okay. That's very interesting. Cause that adds some context to the whole thing. So, um, that's the next question. Maybe you've kind of already answered this. My question is when it, it why pursue it? the way you did? Why shop it around for an audience? Because it sounds like you just, you know, and anybody hears you submitted to a skeptic board, anybody that has any experience with sort of atheism plus, it's like, oh, why? No, you, you want to just sort of reach the internet and protect you, go back in time and stop you from doing that. Because, I mean, I'm sure you've heard horror stories subsequently. Was that just sort of, you just didn't know what that community was like? Yeah, I, I didn't know what that community was like. I saw a couple posts uh, by someone that was discussing some of Jonathan Haidt's work. Okay. And I'm a big fan of his. And, good, because you know, it's very I have some similar. questions based on that. Okay, good. So I, I thought that that group would be receptive. Yeah. And, you know, I didn't look too far into, oh, they're skeptics. You know, I just thought, you know, they'd be skeptical. And my post was actually, you know, what do you think about this? You know, my thoughts right. on Google being an echo chamber is it like, am I in my own echo chamber or am I onto something? So I really just wanted them to poke holes in it. Right. Awesome. Okay. So off to the races. Let's go. Here's my question. The first quote I want to focus on is right off the top. You say, I value diversity and inclusion. I'm not denying that sex sexism exists and don't endorse using stereotypes. When addressing the gap in representation of the population, we need to look at population level differences and distributions. Now, my question is because the men at Google are not typical men, you know, you've probably read the papers about how there's evolutionary advantages of playing sports and boys need to move around to learn. And, you know, computing really flies in the face of these because, you know, we're going to get into a lot of really offensive technical terms. You know, non-participatory male sounds terrible, but that's the, you know, that's the scientific terminology. Non-participatory males are the norm in computing, but not the norm in the general population. So why compare atypical men and typical women what is 
can you respond to that? Like, am I missing something here? Well, so, and the, the major personality trait that I was looking at was the systemizing versus empathizing. And so that, that's one of the largest personality differences between men and women. So it's not necessarily a typical, and of course, you know, most people at Google are outliers in just, exactly. you know, general skill at computing. Right. But I, mean, I, I think, and this wasn't just, you know, Google itself, it was really addressing gender gap in tech, which is a big thing at Google, you know, not just how do we increase diversity at Google, but how do we increase it throughout the industry? And true, I did look it up and Google is not significantly better or worse than any other company. You know, other companies do better on, say, disability access. I was really surprised at how low Google ranks on that. But they're within the norm. They are the second highest, I think, in employee retention, which is still under two years. I mean, um, is there a general consensus that tech in general has a problem? Uh in employee retention, I yeah. think part of that is not that they're necessarily leaving tech in general, but just, you know, there's incentives to just, you know, go work for Facebook and then come back to Google. And each time you change a job, it's a promotion. So I think that gets into something. Like yeah, that. I think that gets into something we'll bring out later. So the next thing I want to say, I completely agree with this statement that you say, if we can't have an honest discussion about this, then we can never truly solve the problem. And like I said, this is totally true, but how do we even begin to have this conversation when these issues are so politicized? It, it's definitely hard. And I mean, I think having this spread throughout the company is definitely not the best way to have a productive conversation. Mm -hmm. I really wanted you know one-on-one -on -one conversations where you can really manage the emotional response yeah. of the people that you're talking to with. Um, yeah, it, it's definitely hard. And I think that's why I really was trying to address the ideological echo chamber. Right. And, uh, you know, try to promote ways in which we can encourage viewpoint diversity. And that would in turn help us have more productive conversations on these topics. Yeah. Now, in one of your core principles, and I feel like there's context missing here, so I'm going to try to word this without judgment. Um, you talk about extreme and authoritarian elements of the Google ideology. Mm -hmm. Was that referring to something specific? Uh, that's my first part of the question, it, just from a purely personal level. Do you think mm -hmm. it was really wise to imply that your bosses are Mussolini? <laughs> I mean, just like, those are strong words. Uh -huh. Yeah, I mean, maybe the word choice was a little too strong, but so what I was referring to in particular was, you know, the, the extreme ideology that all differences that we see in the population are due to injustices. So uh, the blank slate hypothesis, essentially, for men and women that oh, okay. uh, the only difference we see is uh, due to socialization, which is actually very common at Google. And I had multiple conversations with people and they really, it was really hard for them to believe that, uh, that these things weren't just socialization. And then the authoritative aspect is, you know, well, one, the shutting down of conversation and then also the discriminatory practices that they have. Okay. See, that's a bit of context that you actually are encountering strict, um, I guess that's what you mean by social constructionists, like, um, people who believe it's all as opposed to, like you said, the blank slate theory. Um, right. Now, the idea of 50-50 representation in tech and leadership, mm -hmm. you touch on that. Um, why did you choose to focus on men and women instead of, say, racial inequalities? For instance, mm -hmm. non-technical uh, employees at Google who are African American or black, as we say up here, they're actually underrepresented based on population. So why choose mm -hmm. women? Why not focus on something as well with more of a clear disconnect from general population statistics? 
Yeah, so, I mean, there's a lot of cultural and socioeconomic factors uh, that make uh, differences between uh, or disparities that we see in the population through that. And, you know, the economic disparities aren't really evident between men and women because they are raised in the same households. And also geographic uh, things also cause some of the underrepresentation of African Americans because there are simply fewer of them in the area. So you were trying to control variables, essentially. Yeah, and I mean, it's at least just much cleaner to address one topic. And I, I thought there's just much more evidence to say that you know the blank slate hypothesis for uh, there being no gender differences is uh, easier to dispute. So you don't have a um, you don't have a particular interest in gender as opposed to other forms of discrimination. It just happened to be the one that you felt most confident discussing in this context. Right. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I, 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 let me I ask guess... you a more open-ended question. That wasn't fair. Bad interviewer. Um, do you see that there aren't those sort of biological determining functions when it comes to the racial issues at Google? I mean, the company's 53% white, 35% Asian. That's the majority of the company. Do, mm -hmm. do you sort of see that there's just no good reason for some of that? Yeah, I mean, there, there's a lot of cultural factors at play. So it's, and yeah, there aren't, there's not really strong evidence that there's biological determinants of this. Based on race. Right. Yeah. Okay. I, I completely agree. Um, I personally have an issue with the focus on parity. And it sounds, if I'm correct, that Google is it, it kind of drumming it into you that parity, 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 instead of treating that as a distant goal and focusing on year to year improvements. Mm -hmm. Why the focus on perfect parity instead of just moving in the right direction? So I, I think they focus so much on parity because they believe in this uh, total social constructionist okay. idea. Okay. And so nothing else would make sense. That's interesting because that's completely out of whack with how I was taught to read diversity statistics. You know, I was taught you don't read the raw numbers. You look at year-to-year mm -hmm. -year improvements. It's not the – because – you know, you know how it is. An, a number, a statistic can be used to mean a ton of stuff. You have to right. look at, at the greater context. And what drives me crazy about Google is they bury the non-technical gender breakdown in their statistics. They, yeah. they, re they report overall diversity and then technical jobs. They isolate technical jobs, but not the non-technical jobs. And if you actually break it down, they're not even hitting parity in non-technical roles. Now, uh, yeah. do you see that as how do you, how does that compare? Do you see a similar, you know, non blank slate explanation for why Google doesn't even have parity in non technical roles? I guess I'd have to look into what exactly they mean by technical and non technical. Good point. Because I mean, sales they do have more men, women than men. Right. Uh, I, I don't know what other uh, major. Uh, job positions there are at Google that are putting in the non-technical positions. Well, they seem to isolate leadership from non-technical. To me, that's a bit mm. of a false dichotomy because, right. I, well, okay, I shouldn't assume this. I don't know how much outside hiring Google does for their leadership and how much they do it internally. Do you know that? I don't know the breakdown, but okay. at least the mid-level managers are often just, you know, they were previously engineers. And okay. so they're feeding from the same pool. Yeah, so you're drawing your, your leadership numbers from the technical pool as opposed to bringing in people with those, those people interest. Right. Yeah, there's a strong uh, emphasis on the managers still being engineers, essentially. How, how do you feel about that particular um, orientation? I, I don't necessarily see that large of a problem. I mean, there's okay. definitely reasons why they do it because, you know, there's maybe there's just a bias in our culture where we have a lot of respect for engineers. 
And so we wouldn't respect someone that didn't really know technically what was happening. Now, could and that could that be part of the issue that there's too much respect given for things people, people interested in things, and not enough respect given at Google for people who are interested in people? Yeah, so, I mean, that's definitely one aspect that's pushing the uh, gender disparity in my mind. And that yeah, there are... Yeah, there, there are, like, you could call them managers in some way. There's product managers. Right. And those are generally less technical people that uh, are more interested in, in user interface and company strategy rather than uh, technical aspects of the product. Yeah, because that's kind of the complicated thing about what you do is that it's things people use. So you really need both components. Right. And... You know, I laugh my butt off at Silicon Valley because so much of it is so hardcore true. And, you know, it's that hard thing. Oh, a bunch of engineers design an app that engineers love, but no one else knows how to use it. Is, mm -hmm. is there something of that going on internally at Google? You know, you talk about echo chambers. That's an echo mm -hmm. chamber in and of itself. Yeah, and there's definitely some of the bottom-up stuff where an engineer will suggest a feature and, you know, it's highly encouraged. And, you know, it... This was part of the reason I wrote this document too. Was you know there's so much bottom-up encouragement to you know write a document, suggest a change to company policy, and there's definitely advantages and disadvantages to that. I, I think they do try to at least address the fact that uh, engineers aren't really representative of the population when they're designing products. That's but, interesting. Like still a lot of our aspects like uh, dog fooding, which is uh, testing our products within the company. Oh, there's so much jargon. Uh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Wow. Okay. Yeah, that's interesting. So they do do a lot of internal testing. Yeah, but again, that'll only find things that maybe engineers and nerdy people in general uh, don't like. I, that, well, that, to be completely honest, is why my, my little nerd ears pricked up at that non-technical staff thing, because I would think that if you you know, diversify your pool in non-technical staff, then you can pull them in to, what do you think of this internally? Right. And then you don't have to bring anybody in, you don't get anybody have to sign a one-day NDA or anything like that. It just kind of makes sense. Like you said, take the morality out of it. It kind of makes sense to beef up your diversity in those non-technical roles. So at least you start, you know, you start the pot boiling. Right. right. There's there's no real compelling reason why somebody who's well nobody answers a phone at Google anymore. It's all email. But you know that kind of role, those sort of um, do. I shouldn't assume this. I'm thinking of gaming where we have a lot of producers that are mm -hmm. very much people people who are just there to make sure milestones are hit and try to minimize the crunches. Does Google have people in those roles? Yeah, that would maybe be a program manager. And is, or, that, you know, is that considered a technical or non-technical job? It, it's sort of between product yeah. manager and engineer. I, I don't know how they decide in these diversity numbers what that is. That's but, very interesting. And you know, if you go from product manager, program manager, and engineer, the gender disparity is more women in the product managers and program managers and fewer in the engineering. Which makes sense, but... The important mm -hmm. thing is they're still there. Right. Right. Now, I have a, I have a statement for you, and I'm, I just want to get your thoughts in it. Um, it sounds like Google is sort of using the we're no worse than anyone else defense. And in that way, mm -hmm. they're talking the talk a lot, but they're really not walking the walk. Basically, their commitment to diversity lacks commitment. I, it's... It's sort of hard though because everyone's drawing from the same pool. Right. So, you know, you can't get more from one part of the population without just paying them more than the competitor is willing to, right? Okay. Unless you make it such that Google has a reputation such that it's way more inclusive to these people. Well, that, and that then really, they would naturally go, right? That that really is the one thing that we found works, isn't it? That people gravitate to companies with people like them already there. I mean, mm -hmm. that seems to be, which 
is a real chicken and the egg conundrum and that they found women go into places that have women and we start seeing exponential increases in things like biology, medicine, chemistry, you know, these are sciences, but when women see women, they consider it as a career. Um, you, you're familiar with the science I'm talking about, right? Like the studies that talk about this stuff. Yeah, I mean, that, that effect is definitely true. Yeah. I, I think that there are definitely many factors at play. Yeah. I'm, right. I'm going to stick a pin in this because I, I am going to go back to it later. Mm -hmm. um, I want to... I want to ask you about a particular question because I want to see what you really think about it. You say at one point, discrimination to reach equal representation is unfair, divisive, and bad for business. Do you see how this could be read as implying that women at Google got their jobs because of discriminatory hiring practices? I, I can see that interpretation, but it's really the, there's just multiple layers of you know, small level discrimination happening. And sure, but this is practices... a merit argument you're making here. Mm -hmm. If it's discriminatory, it's not interest. It's actually you're saying they're not qualified. I, so I'm not saying that they're not qualified. Okay. But I'm saying that out of a pool, they are taking race and gender into account, which some people would argue is unfair. It really unfair, depends on your personal values. Unfair and outright discriminatory aren't the same thing, though. Uh, like it's it's unfair no, so, that tons of qualified people get rejected at Google, no matter what, just because there aren't enough jobs and a lot of applicants. To say yeah, something so, is discriminatory is a much more charged accusation. No, but I mean, it is discriminatory if you take these things into account. Only That's if just they're like not the definition otherwise of qualified. No, like if you take a protected status mm -hmm. into account in employment critical situations, okay. that is discrimination. And by some interpretations of the law, that is illegal. I see what you're that, saying. That, okay. that was what I was trying to point out. I, I see what you're saying. And this is what, yay, this is why we're having this conversation. Um, getting into your, your background stuff, mm -hmm. um, you talk about bias. Right. And I completely agree with you. I mean, I've, I'm, it's, I've read Jonathan Haidt as well, I, you know, devoured The Righteous Mind. That book caused me to really think about my own biases. Right. So, I mean, and that actually made me more open um, to people who don't think like myself. You know, this idea that, oh, you know, conservatives aren't bad people. They just have <laughs> a higher disgust trigger. They can't help it. It's, it's, it's inherited, potentially. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, what do you think your biases are? Yeah, so I, I tried to outline my two biggest biases in relation to this, and it's that I really value individualism and reason, which you know really blinded me to a lot of the group-based uh, emotional response that happened to this. That's interesting. Okay. Now, if you value individuality, why make a argument based on norms? Uh, which argument based on norms? What well, your you argument basically is we shouldn't expect um, parity at Google because population-wide, less women are interested. That's not an approach based on individuality. That's a, that's a class-based approach. Well, no, it's if we treat people as individuals and stop looking at their group identity, then we would just naturally get a position such that there aren't 50-50. But, but why if you're dealing with individuals and not norms? Like you're not okay. basing it on how many applicants to Google are women or black or Asian or whatever. That would be, that would be apples to apples. That would be, okay, we're only getting 10% of applicants that are women or 20% of applicants that are women. I'm pulling these numbers out of my ass, guys. My audience is very big on getting statistics right. But um, to say we're not getting the applicants, therefore we can't give people more of a chance, which I think is essentially what you're arguing, based on group status. But isn't that the relevant number, not population-wide trends? So I, 
I, mean, I was really addressing not necessarily the numbers at Google, but the numbers in tech in the population. And so okay. we, we have to look at the population. Okay. So you're extrapolating beyond Google's walls? To some extent. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, now, okay. Great quote here. Okay. Before that, why do you think that you're, you've got three or four statements of intent in this document? Yeah. Before you get into it. And it mm -hmm. seems like in the criticism you face, those have been completely ignored. <laughs> Why do you think that is? Uh, I mean, I think people that want to criticize me will criticize me no matter what. And I mean, it's just like how they'll, and they'll just label people I mean, just one example that's very recent is, you know, labeling Ben Shapiro as a white supremacist and mm, member of the yes. alt-right or something. I saw that on your Twitter, yeah. When, you know, he's Jewish and, like, he's very much against a lot of these ideas. Yeah, he's more neocon than alt-right. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I, I mean, I, I appreciate him just because, you know, he seems to be very intelligent. He's a super smart guy. Yeah. Being, being neocon doesn't make you dumb. Yeah. 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 Okay. Okay. Um, you said, quote, Google has several biases and honest discussion about these biases is being silent by the dominant ideology. What follows is by no means the complete story, but it's a perspective that desperately needs to be told to Google. Google bias is at Google. We talk so much about unconscious bias that applies to race and gender, but we rarely discuss our moral bias. Mm -hmm. Now, whether something is scientifically observable, which you draw on a lot, is not accessing that thing from a moral perspective. And one of the complexities of what you wrote is you're trying to access morality through scientific observation. So were you aware of that contradiction? Uh, so I was more trying to address that the morals are blinding us to the science. And just as conservatives can sometimes deny climate change and evolution, mm -hmm. progressives deny some aspects of human nature. In fairness, though, climate change is a lot more scientific consensus on that than some of these Evo psych things, simply because it's just been studied for so much longer. I mean, we've only had the tools to really measure physiological responses to stress, for instance, less than a decade. I mean, some of this personality stuff is, you know, 50 years old. Yes, yes some of it is, absolutely. But it's self-reported. We can't actually right. get into what the body's doing. And that, I'll stick a pin in that because I want to get back to that. But, um, yeah, I don't want to get ahead of myself. Um, you, again, you say, of course, women and men experience bias in tech and the workplace differently. And we should be cognizant of this, but it's far from the whole story. Now, Joe Rogan really pressed you on this in uh, not the most polite of terms. He was like, well, that, you know, he said something at one point. Um, that's why they told you to fuck off. And you kind of went, and, you know, do you, you I think you were kind of shell-shocked and didn't really get a chance to address that because you were like, whoa, do you care, care to kind of clarify what he was going for there? Like, do you, do you kind of see that any sort of validity to some of the emotional responses that people had? Huh? I, I definitely see validity in some of the emotional responses. Mm -hmm. I mean, especially you know, if you're in an echo chamber, it's very painful to see dissenting viewpoints. Sure. And, so you're sympathetic to that. Yeah. Okay. And, I, we may touch on this later, but you know, most of the emotional responses, it was predicted based on political orientation and not gender. So, well, okay, we'll we'll get into this now because we're talking about it, and I'll try not to bring it up later. Hate himself actually says that emotional responses are the first thing people feel, and then the logical explanations for them are a post priori justification. Right. So, based on that. Is it even possible to really have a truly dispassionate 
discussion about this based on that's just the way physiologically the human brain works. It's definitely difficult. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, a lot of the one on one conversations I've had, it's involved very long discussions. And, you know, I'm still trying to learn how best to address these things and also how best to, you know, speak to the other person's morals in some ways, right? That, that playing to the audience, difficult. essentially. Yeah. 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 Now, what do you actually believe holistically, not just trying to argue a counterpoint? I, I don't want you to assign a number, but sort of you, you haven't really had an opportunity to talk about the things you think actually are cultural. And I think that's given people a skewed perspective of your viewpoint. So I'd like to give you an opportunity to discuss that end of it now. Uh, and there's definitely cultural things, especially, you know, there may be women, you know, like hanging out with other women in some cases. And so if there aren't as many of your peers interested in this, then that will naturally cause you to not be interested in it. Oh, that, and that's that's spot on with the science because they actually find that girls drop the, the the interest in tech vacillates throughout a woman's lifetime i don't know if you've seen these um these studies that it mm. rises in middle school no surprise they funneled a ton of money into grade seven and eight girls learn to code things it plummets in high school when the programs aren't there so much and the number one reason cited isn't lack of interest it's my friends aren't there and yeah, although it lack of interest again. was also there, right? What's that? Lack of interest was also a major reason, right? It was, well, saying it's boring isn't necessarily lack of interest in the subject. It's the way the subject's taught. Maybe, yeah. It's boring is the number two, but the number one answer was my friends aren't there. And yeah. so, well, lack of interest is a factor. It's not the primary factor. You can address 33% of girls just by making it more socially acceptable to do coding in high school. Right. I, although, you know, it's also not that socially acceptable for guys to do it either. You know, yeah. I, I was a nerd throughout high school yeah. and, you know, throughout my life. And I can definitely tell you that it doesn't make you very popular. Well, that, that hence my first question that you are not a typical dude, James, like right. uh, one of the most profound moments, I think it was during your Dave Rubin interview where you're like, I'm not competitive. I like it was this very pure moment of look not all guys are like this and you shouldn't be treated as less of value because you're not a stereotype right. and I I really I really connected to that like that is on a human level something I completely understand that desire to be given worth based on you as an individual and not based on your a class based assignment Right. You know, yeah. um, and that that's kind of why I wanted to talk to you, because I want more of that, James. I, I want, <laughs> you know, I want to reach into your brain and, and kind of see what's going on there that way, because that was a really powerful moment. Um, mm -hmm. You know, and so this is this is a really bad segue because we're going for emotion to something really, really. I want to talk about the Heterodox Academy's um, uh, analysis of mm -hmm. what you wrote. Right. And you retweeted it. So, and, and you think, you know, you think the Heterodox Academy is, is a really great organization. You seemed quite positive. Um, and I thought it was very telling that you were very positive on an article that at least in part disagrees with you. You know, they said that most researchers studying these questions assume that biology, childhood socialization, and current context interact in complex ways. And most psychologists know that pointing to a biological contribution, such as a genetic or hormonal influence, does not mean an effect is hardwired, unmalleable, or immune to cult uh, contextual variables. Sorry, I stepped on the end there. But, you know, according to Heterodox Academy, experts were split on the science you cited. It was basically six in favor, four in the same article, and then five against or partially against. So, right. so uh, I, I would say that their quote doesn't really contradict anything that I was saying. How so? You know, I, I mean, I, I never say that biology is the end all answer. I'm just saying that it has some effect that we shouldn't ignore. And that of course, 
culture and biology interact in many ways. And so, it, you know, their quote doesn't really uh, disagree with it. So we and agree with of, what they're saying here. Right. And, okay. you know, in their analysis of different papers, I felt like they, they put things that they said disagreed with mine, but never, I, I didn't feel like they actually disagreed with it. So, and, and I thought some of the things they put in the agree column were, well, I, I agree with you. It wasn't as cut and dried as I think there should have probably right. been more in the ambivalent column. Yeah. So like, I think the most common thing that they said disagreed with mine was that, you know, they weren't showing average differences in math ability. And I never talked about math ability at all. No, no, you didn't. You talked about interest. Right. Right. That's interesting. Because, yeah. Now, if you were writing that, document for public consumption would you approached it differently definitely okay i mean i was writing to engineers and right oh, okay yeah yeah see that's the thing that sucks about it being leaked is yeah. there's there is inadequate context to what you wrote um <laughs> and so i want to get into the things you talked about in terms of differences and one of the things you talked about is openness towards feelings and aesthetics rather than ideas. Right. And I think a lot of people are going to read that and go, what does that even mean? Because <laughs> aesthetic can be an idea. Sure. <laughs> you know, especially when you get into questions of morality and politics and, and these really complicated things that are feelings and aesthetics and ideas. Mm -hmm. You know. Because, I mean, this is, um, you know, the people rather than things thing, the, yeah. the empathizing versus systemizing. And this is something I come up, I come against myself because I am a, the tests I've taken, I'm split both. I do both. But right. I have a lot of people assuming that I'm a more touchy feely person than I am, or they yeah. criticize me for not being more touchy feely than I am. And so I get more criticism for essentially defying my gender. Right. I prefer systems based jobs. But, mm -hmm. you know, there are a number of things that I know the guy they hired, I know he's not as qualified as me. And I can't help but feel that because of the assumption that I am a natural empathizer, and they need a systemizer, they toss my resume. Right. So how do we accept the science on this point and not allow the science to bias hiring? Yeah, so, I mean, I tried to state multiple times that we should treat people as individuals and but how you know, do we these do that distributions overlap I, by not really taking their gender into account. I think that would help at least. But how do we do that and acknowledge the science? So the science is really just to see, okay, if we want to make this more approachable to women in general in the population, then these are some things that we could change. But it, this doesn't say anything about one individual, right? So to summarize, you're saying if we actually want more women, we have to make the jobs attractive to a larger portion of women not just hire the women we get on some sort of unbalanced paradigm. Right. And okay. I mean, that, that would help make the workplace more inclusive in some ways. Sure. Uh, that's a very valid point. And there's a lot of, there's a lot of studies out there that agree with you on that. Um, now, my next question is, you say correctly that a majority of women relatively prefer jobs and i like that you say relatively prefer that was a nice bit of specificity there relatively prefer jobs in social or artistic areas mm -hmm. but most published writers are men most successful um artists are men if women prefer and in some ways people would claim excel in certain you know physical characteristics associated with the arts why are history's most famous artists men? Yeah, so I, I don't know that answer, and I'm not sure anyone really does. Of course, historically, there has been a lot of, you know, probably just sexism, you know, in the okay. past centuries. So, you're so that, willing... that's caused a lot of the yeah. 
you know, famous uh, artists. Now, I, I really don't know what the art scene right now is. So about I can't the same say as the tech that. scene, not going to lie. Oh, really? you. Uh, yeah. Um, now, flipping the question by focusing on this, oh, girls prefer art. Doesn't this contribute to the stigma against artistic men and boys? I, yeah, I think that there's definitely stigma against uh, males doing feminine things. Right. But, yeah, I, I really try to say that we shouldn't restrict people to their gender role and that we should just treat them as individuals. Oh, I know you did. I'm just trying to get you to see why some mm. people would be very frustrated and being confronted with this again, because you're not advocating discriminating against people based on social norms. But there are plenty of people out there who use this as a justification to keep atypical people out of jobs they're actually suited to, maybe not based on gender, but based on individuality. Like this is the stuff that's cited to tell me I don't deserve computing jobs. Really? I mean, yeah. that's really unfortunate that's happening. I think, though, that that's exactly why we need to have these open, honest discussions, because if we're ne never able to address this and say, you know, this is what a population level distribution say, but, you know, we still care about the individual. Like, that's what Google needs to say, right? And if they never actually say this, they never say that, yes, these are true, but you know, this is how we're addressing it. And so when they just it, incorrectly say that what I said was just false, then right. they're never addressing it. And so people will just look in, into it and say, hey, this is actually accurate. And especially with a lot of these uh, stereotypes, they can be formed by just naturally looking at who you interact with and so the stereotypes that we create in our brains are actually relatively accurate. Well, they're based Just on like something. average. Level. They're they're, yeah, anecdot yeah. they're anecdotally accurate. They're not scientifically provable. I they are representative of some average that is actually statistically accurate. In some cases, because there's a I, historically women being and I'm getting ahead, women being more neurotic was a reason given to deny women the right to vote on humanitarian grounds, that voting was too stressful for women, therefore our husbands should take care of us, take care of it for us. Uh, Christina Hoff Summers touched on some of these in the piece she wrote about your um, mm -hmm. uh, article, which must have been awesome for you because you were a fan of it. And she kind of backed you up, but there mm -hmm. is a lot of historical diciness on right. all these points. And that's what makes this so difficult is that on, on the, I, I think that quote you just gave about Google, you know, clip that, make that the sizzle reel, boom. It shows you're really passionate about this issue and that you actually care about getting it right. On the other <laughs> hand, we really have to be careful in, and this is why it sucks that you've, you know, done interviews and they cut the crap out of what you said. Mm -hmm. Because this is very granular and this is very nuanced and, you know, the, the side effect of this, be, of this being embraced by the alt-right, it doesn't matter how much you condemn it, some people are just going to go, nope, 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 not a Nazi, not a Nazi, right. condemning to show I'm not a Nazi. The tribalism surrounding this phenomenon is, you know, not only... Um, really unfortunate because we can't have these conversations but also i find it completely dehumanizing to you as an individual mm -hmm. and that's why i asked off the top how do we talk about this um without but let's get into that neuroticism thing and i don't want to deal with it i know you've said you wish you hadn't used that word i'm not going to make uh, you repeat it you know i'm not that mean uh, uh -huh. i want to talk to you about that thing we touched on before the idea of that fact you're right that women report more anxiety that is actually how you worded it you said this may contribute to the higher levels of anxiety women report mm -hmm. and to the loyal number of women in high stress jobs you actually said report but these are self-reported studies and physiological studies conflict 
with the fact that women actually report more stress based on the same stimuli. Mm -hmm. So I think this is a bit dated. Are, are you aware of the ones I'm talking about? Like, first of all, women is a little bit too blanket. Married women report significantly more stress than single women. And that almost exclusively makes up the gap in stress reporting. I think married women, and I may get this wrong, but are 33%. 33% of women who are married exhibit extreme stress, whereas single women are very close to men. It's 22% to 20%. So that married women statistic makes up the bulk of the gap. And the amount of stress a woman reports correlates with the amount of housework she does. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, I, I haven't looked into the exact uh, details of the breakdown. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I know that uh, higher neuroticism is linked to you can hormones. say that word here it's okay you don't have to mumble it we're not offended by the word neuroticism yeah. and so yeah it, this may be related to uh being married and potentially caring for children yep. which you know is at least the evolutionary psychology explanation for why women tend to worry more and have higher anxieties but it's to also take a, care of children. It's also a modern psychology thing that, well, first of all, that's not a bad thing. Right. That, you know, it's also mo just modern psychology. Women have more shit to do on a regular day. I mean, that's not a weakness. That's just a fact. Mm. Yeah, so I mean, I, I think, though, and you have to be careful with that, though, because Yes, there I'm are generalizing, a lot of, of course. Yeah. Yeah, there are a lot of housework type things that men do more of, like, you know, taking care of the car and uh, just outside work. And white collar men actually report doing more housework than blue collar men. That was an interesting statistic I discovered. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, yeah, again, it's not across the board. I yeah. see you thinking. You have a thinking face. It's so <laughs> awesome. You are making so much thinking face in this interview. Um, I. I want to flip it on this because there's another, and this is something very important to my viewers, um, male loneliness syndrome and the male suicide rate epidemic. Both of these indicate that the male way of handling stress is actually not the healthy one. That it's encouraged in the workforce to just suck it up, buttercup. The, the female talk it out, own, name your stress, label your stress to dissipate your stress, report more stress is actually healthier, but it's actually, it, it doesn't get you as far at work. Workplaces favor the male way of managing it, which isn't managing it, it's repressing it. And then we have this crisis of men in their late 40s, 50s, and 60s killing themselves because they can't handle it anymore. So is perhaps the solution here not to focus on, I want to say the word because you're so beat up by this word, but not to focus on female stress levels, but to start focusing on male stress levels and perhaps recognize that the amount of stress we expect men to take is not fair. Mm -hmm. Would you agree with that statement? Yeah, I think, you know, at least in the workplace, men seem to take higher stress jobs and, you know, generally undesirable jobs and because they pay so well. that and yeah yeah and so in that way it's unfair well, and that, that's that, definitely something that we should address well that actually touches on the other thing you brought up correctly that in uh societies with a lower gender pay gap you see more sex typical work right well that's because the sex typical work doesn't have the pay imbalance i mean most of those countries are heavily socialist countries that deal with people as classes. They have a very high tax rate. So teachers get paid better. You know, nurses get paid better. These caregiver roles are paid better. So there's less incentive to take gender atypical jobs. Right. And I mean, we see this even within the U.S., for example. So if you look at uh, low economic status uh, families and high economic status yeah. families, there's uh, in the low economic status families, there's no real gender gap in the STEM in general. But well, then no, when you look at the high ones, there are much fewer women that go into STEM and they go more into social jobs. Well, because they don't because, need the money. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. But is that actually indicating interest in the work 
or is that basically a lack of social a, a a lack of social deterrent against conformity. That was a double negative. I apologize. <laughs> Let me try to make that clearer. <laughs> because of the crap that you have experienced and that I have experienced for being gender atypical, it is just mm -hmm. easier not to swim upstream. If, this is, if there are not financial incentives to going into these jobs that value atypical skills, isn't this just possibly not completely, but a huge portion of it is actually just social conformity. I'll take less crap from my mom if I become a nurse than a computer scientist. Yeah, I think that's definitely impacts things. Social conformity does uh, influence people's behavior, for sure. There you go, guys, you said it. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, because I, I thought that was, in, I mean, you were clearly arguing against the hardcore um, it's all culture. It's all social thing. Mm -hmm. But this was the thing that was thrown in my face after your document was leaked. And I'm sitting here going, guys, you're sitting here lecturing an atypical woman on female norms. Like, that's preposterous. But it was amazing. I mean, you know what it's like to get the angry comments. There's never just one. They just bombard, right? They swarm. Yeah. And I'm like, this is nonsensical. This is denying me my individuality because of science. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we do have a problem in this culture that women's work is valued less than men's work. We talked about that systems versus people and, and all that stuff. Um, mm -hmm. How do we, I guess we really can't, but do you think tech can actually make a difference on its own without creating a greater cultural equality between the value of, say, teaching, nursing, childcare from a financial way and these male dominated jobs? I mean, yeah, so I think it's definitely causing part of the gender gap, the fact mm -hmm. that tech pays a lot. And so there's some men that just join it because it pays so well, even though they aren't necessarily more interested in it than they, they would like be. They like money. In it. Their interest right. is money. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and you know, there's, they're pressured to do it for the money. Now, you, you touch on status. And this was a line I'm like, oh, I know what he's saying. I wish he had said it differently. <laughs> that. You said that men are more strongly judged by status and women by beauty. The right. issue is beauty is status. Yeah, so, I mean, the status, I guess, means I mean, something different. Than well, what I think you were trying to say is that men, status is created for men by wealth. Right. Beauty creates status for women. It is not that women are less interested in status we are sorted into different piles for what that status means. I mean, we all know, you know, the stereotype is wealthy men marrying beautiful women. And that's a high status man marrying a high status woman. Right. But Although, in order to get that high status man, you have to pursue status as a woman. Yeah. And I, mean, I guess we would have to disentangle that to, when we're looking at the literature because yeah, the scientific literature does say that there is more status-seeking behavior in men. Oh, that is the term. Yeah. And that's why yeah. I'm like, that's why I said, I know what he's saying. But any woman that has ever seen a woman carrying around a $10,000 handbag knows women are very interested in status. Like, Louis Vuitton would not exist were it not a status symbol. It's the sports car for women, a $10,000 handbag. Yeah, although I think it's more do or die for men than it is for women in some cases. In the working just, world, sure. Well, just, you know, for just reproduction, uh, there are fewer men that end up reproducing. And so they need to push it. And the high status men can have many more children than the low status ones while... Sorry, I'm smirking it, because... Avoid the Trump joke. Avoid the Trump joke. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh -huh. But I mean, I mean, yeah. Um, you're right. 
On the other hand, that gap is going down. There are a lot more childish, childish, oh God, that was a Freudian slip. There are a lot more childless women now than there were even 30 years ago. Right. So we, we are seeing a decline in the gap. Yeah, that's possible for sure. And, and the number of children, you know, I forget the terminology now. Oh, my anthropology prof is going to kill me. The idea of, you know, monogamous Western family structure is not replicated throughout the world. You know, there's the Hawaiian model that everybody's your aunt, uncle, cousin, just that's friend groups. Families are organized differently. There's, you know, mm -hmm. in, in certain African, you know, indigenous cultures that, practice ancestor worship women take on the roles of men in order to continue that ancestral line this is a complex thing we start talking about mm -hmm. status and what status means culture to culture i mean status for say the afro-caribbean community even in beauty standard is not the same as a white european mm -hmm. so again this is a pretty granular issue yeah so how, how do we sort of amend this portion of your document to sort of take out that you were speaking to engineers for popular consumption? What were you trying to say there? Uh, I think there's a higher pressure for men to make a lot of money, pretty much. Okay, I think everybody can agree with that. <laughs> okay. Good. I mean, you also talk about the um, firefighting, mining, dangerous jobs, the male fatality rate. You're absolutely right. Mm -hmm. The thing is, part of the reason women didn't become firefighters is there were no showers or washrooms for women at fire stations. They were communal showers. Women would have had to shower with the men. Same yeah. with mining, same with these things. So while, yes, there is a desire for men because these are high-paid blue-collar jobs, there were also barriers to women. I mean, these, mm -hmm. uh, can we agree that these are exam These are perfect examples of things where yes, there were two different types of social pressures and the expectation of what a real man does, but also financial incentives sorting men into real men jobs, but then also a biological brainstem, lizard brain, whatever you want to call it, men are just on the whole physically stronger than women. So back in the days when you had to haul a fire hose over your shoulder, mm -hmm. more men are physically qualified for that job than women. Right. So yeah, can... there's definitely multiple factors at play. Yeah. Okay. You heard it guys. You heard <laughs> it. <laughs> um, and I guess, you know, throughout this document, it was really that this was the perspective that was being silenced. Yeah. And so it was never supposed to be the whole story. It was just, you were playing devil's advocate. Yeah, in which, many ways. Which sucks, you know, that, <laughs> that you're, being, you're being criticized for a rhetorical style in a particular environment that was never intended for public consumption. Right. Yeah, which is why I think it's important to let people see the, holistically what you actually believe. So we're, we're getting there. Um, I want to talk about this whole cooperation thing. We already talked about the, the girls and friends and, and things like that. I just hate group work. I hate <laughs> yeah. group work. And the reason I hate group work is I didn't think it was fair that I either have to do way more work than anybody else because we're all marked. We're mm -hmm. all given the same mark. Or I have to go, no, on principle, I'm not doing it and affect my grades. And that absolutely put me off group work. And when I was reading the part on cooperation, it's like, no, I hate group work. I hate people, they, they're users. And I think there's, there's some more granular stuff on that whole female cooperative dynamic that is quite complex because mm -hmm. girls are supposed to be more cooperative. Girls are forced into things, you know, guys are, you don't like each other, less and less. There's sort of a, a, a decrease in the gap here as well, but men more and more are expected. Everybody get along, everybody be friends, you're all friends. That encourages relational bullying, alternative aggression, 
you know, these, these power trips, these echo chambers, precisely these echo chambers form in these stereotypically female so-called cooperative environments. And right. so this is something, I mean, Google, I found this very interesting that you said this because Google is held up as the company that designed the open workplace. And so mm -hmm. I, I, it really struck me that you're saying it's actually not cooperative at all. So what, mm -hmm. you know more than this, what's going on here? Uh, well, as for software engineering not being necessarily that cooperative, it's a lot of, you know, and I saw this a lot for my own work where I ended up sort of being an expert in something and then being sort of the consultant for many different uh, projects. So people would just ask me stuff and I would tell them. And this is on, um, I want to call it bioinformatics, but that's not it. Um, no, I, so this was at Google. So, okay. you know, I, I would, I understood the entire search stack. And so, which was uncommon knowledge for a lot of Wait, people. There was one guy at all of Google who understood a particular search stack. Uh, I mean, at least at my oh, level, there may have, there may have been, you know, more people, but I was often the one asked for you were the guy available. Yeah. Okay. And, okay. You ran uh, away the slowest. <laughs> <laughs> I, it's often, you know, just my drive to understand systems, which led me to become in that situation. But, uh, so this consultant like behavior though, isn't really rewarded at Google. There's no way to say, oh yes, this person helped with these five different projects. Therefore, you know, we'll promote them or something. It's more, this person drove this one project through and was essentially the alpha male and uh, now we'll promote them for launching this one project. Okay, I get what you're saying. In gaming parlance, is you only get XP for being the tank, not being the healer, essentially. Sure, yeah. I mean, yeah, okay, okay. The whole audience now understands what's going on here. <laughs> That's very interesting that the corporate identity that Google has, because everybody converted their workplaces into shared spaces because of Google. And it sounds like you're saying it's something of a gloss. It's actually not indicative of how the company actually functioned. Yeah, I mean, I think they try to reward these things, but it's just a very hard problem. And I'm not necessarily blaming Google on this. I don't know. I exactly can blame Google. How... <laughs> I mean, the I open workplace that. stuff, I don't like. What's that? I, I don't like some of the open workplace stuff just oh, because of the noise. I but... hate it. It drives me crazy. Everybody has to put on headphones because nobody likes the white noise. Can we please go back to offices? But I mean, I'm going to Yoda Google. There is no try. Do or do not. Either, <laughs> And I think this is sort of what you were saying. Either your programs generate results or you have to get a new program. There's no point in continuing to do things that just are getting you abysmal year-to-year -year increases. Mm -hmm. Like, is there any awareness inside that 1% a year is really not good? Yeah, although, and they, they just blame it on the pipeline. And Interesting. They're I, blaming I, it on what you were arguing and, wow. Okay. <laughs> Alrighty, let's move on. Um, you, we sort of talked about pressure. I want to flip it because you made kind of a beautiful statement I was getting. And this was a statement that made me realize this guy's not a sexist. He's just either speaking to a particular audience or phrasing this awkwardly because you said, feminism has made great progress in freeing women from the female gender role, but men are still very much tied to the male gender role. If we as a society allow men to be more feminine, then the gender gap will shrink, although probably because men will leave tech and leadership for traditionally feminine roles. Mm -hmm. That is not really the mark of someone who fears and hates women. <laughs> I mean, this, right. <laughs> this, you have to turn your misogyny card in, James. I hate to break it to you. You fail at misogyny. Uh, <laughs> but the idea of gender role is something that is of great interest to the people watching this viewer video because mm. gender roles change throughout history at a rate faster 
than it is explained from purely biological evolution. A lot right. of these things have no social purpose. They are like plumage on a peacock, right? It's that status thing we were talking again. Why did men wear powdered wigs and lace stockings and lace cuffs? Well, it showed you weren't a laborer, right? Mm. You weren't getting dirty. So you could wear these ridiculous frilly garments. But if we look back at, you know, these 17th century French suits, they're baby pink and lace. And it's, it's very what we would call feminine now. High-heeled shoes started as a male invention, transferred over to women. Pants connoted status back in the day. Everybody wore tunics, but they were inconvenient for horseback riding. So high-status men had horses, so they wore pants to show off. So gender role is profoundly different than that starting point, right? Um, right? And your insights on gender role, I think are getting really lost in the biology stuff. So I'd like to give you an opportunity to talk about this more because this is a very, very earnest, I think very personal, passage and i'd like to give you more time to talk about it so you have the floor just what do you want to say i'm sorry i know you're an introvert and <laughs> open-ended questions are terrifying but i have to ask open or open-ended questions this is the journalism 101 so mm -hmm. go for it what do you hope people take away from that kind of glossed over portion of what you wrote uh man, i it's very much that men get punished for not fitting the male gender role and some of the easiest ways of seeing it is you know we so often tell boys you know don't cry uh, don't be a girl and you know while it's sort of okay for women to be tomboys mm -hmm. it it's definitely not okay for uh, men to be a sissy or just feminine anyway. And you could see it with how we dress too, where you know, women wear pants and or dresses while men can only wear pants and can never wear dresses. And Unless you're Will Smith's kid. <laughs> yeah. I, obviously there's Cobain. exceptions and yeah. 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 It's the exceptions but, that prove the rule though. Those were, you know, as Judith Butler would call it subversive acts of gender performance. Mm -hmm. It's not subversive if you're rewarded for it, right? You're bucking the trend. Yeah. Do you think this ties in to this idea that men have to kill themselves for their job? I I think so because I mean the male gender role is that of protector and provider. That's and right. So you know if they don't provide for the family, then they're useless in some ways. I know this is a loaded question, but I have to ask it anyway. Again, it's my job. Do you think that Google is leveraging stereotypes with its lengthy work hours? And it's that that unhealthy competition, you think if they were truly looking for an equal playing field, wouldn't they just hire more people so employees don't have to kill themselves with these crazy long hours? Uh, and the, so they say that, you know, we support work life balance, saying and it and doing it, Yoda, Yoda, <laughs> there is no try do or do not. And you know some managers do like so it's different between different teams and okay. I I think you know I sort of support them in saying that you, you can't really control what individual people do and so if one person is really passionate about it and has a ton of free time and just wants to work 80 hours a week if that doesn't pressure other employees to do the same then I think that's fine and you know, they should be rewarded for working extra hours, I think. I see if you're rewarded for extra hours, that imp that does pressure other employees to work extra hours. That that's positive reinforcement. That's hit the buzzer, win a cookie. That's practically Pavlovian. Yeah. Although I, I think things are sufficiently not zero sum in some ways that it's okay to reward people and maybe not reward them so openly, but you know, there's a lot of private incentives of just uh, bonuses and your salary that aren't open. And still, still though, first of all, people talk. 
Second of all, mm -hmm. the merit is rewarded for kill yourself at work. There's another completely different school of management and hiring that a company wants well-rounded employees. And so they actually say, go home, go play video games, go to a baseball game, watch movies, do something. I want you to be able to talk about something other than work. And yeah. when you're expecting people to work 80 hours a week, they don't have any interests outside of out of the company. It it is what it is the kind of employee they want to have. They want specialists, not generalists. Yeah. So I mean, I would say that they definitely don't pressure people to be to work eighty hours a week, though. And the people that do work those long hours are more just. It's often international uh, workers that are just out of college or something. So they don't have a family and they really don't have much else to do. And it's, they're just, I mean, so a lot that, of this- That is exploitative Asians, though. Like but, I hear that and I hear mm -hmm. like, well, that's wage slavery. Like it's well-paid wage slavery, but come on, that's go out and talk to girls. <laughs> you know, it just, it, that really bothers me to hear that, that they're bringing people who are socially isolated and exploiting that social isolation for greater work hours. Yeah, yeah, this does come up sometimes, like the potential for, there may be some ageist um, elements in Silicon Valley where we mm -hmm. do select for these just out of college people that don't have a family, therefore they'll work extra hours. Mm -hmm. And then they burn out. We just hire somebody new the minute they want yeah. a life. Well, you're not as you're not as productive anymore. That's I mean, ageism is a huge thing that isn't mm -hmm. talked about. Right. And yeah. there's a real there's a loss of institutional memory because, you know, the people that don't move on rest in peace, Steve Jobs, you know, they they die very young. Right. That isn't long term good for business, good for society, and good for the economy, and we get back into 50-year-old men blowing their brains out. You know, right. these things are really interconnected. It's not fair for someone to knock themselves out in their 20s and 30s at a company, and then when they do want to have kids, they do want to have families, don't treat that what you what you built for comfort not built for speed what you lose in performance you gain in a really smooth ride you know it it mm -hmm. that wisdom um would probably help employees manage stress you know mm -hmm. the mentors are getting lost because what's the point of having a mentor that's been at the company only four years more than you you know mm -hmm. it, it's it is it is strange like it seems to me that if they address some of these things a lot of these diversity issues would and i think you're you're inferring this in your document kind of sort themselves out because they don't want this one very particular type of candidate at the exclusion of all others right and family values are something of a conservative position so that kind of comes into that as well i i want to mm -hmm. i want to talk about um, this idea of mentoring, because I brought it up, mm -hmm. and these, I want to try to phrase this properly. Networking is a major acknowledged problem with women in leadership. They found that women aren't in the networks, so they don't get the leadership jobs because network is essential to hiring in that field. It's not about what you know, it's who you know, knowing the right people, getting them to like you, blah, blah, blah. By isolating people in gender or race specific classes, which you call out as a problem, it actually separates them from the general networking pool. Right. And I am interested in the justification they gave for why this works because it seems to fly in the face of all the best practices I've ever been taught. Mm -hmm. So what's going on here at Z Google? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's often related to them just looking at one, uh, one aspect of saying, 
you know, women aren't doing as well in one aspect on average, and therefore we need to help all women in every way possible. And they don't necessarily look at all the side effects of this. They just, you know, it's really hard to uh, criticize some of these programs, right? Because- Oh, I'm really good at it. <laughs> you noticed. <laughs> yeah. I, at least as an outsider, you know, I can't ever criticize any of these, so. Yeah, you find yeah, out it's... what happens when you bite the hand that feeds. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, nobody wants to be the diversity candidate, right? <laughs> I mean, I know I don't want to be hired because I'm a woman. I want to be hired because I'm a woman with badass skills. Because if you get hired right. because you're a woman, people know. You yeah. know, they know you're the diversity hire and they don't take you seriously. And it's just like, oh, well, as a woman, what do you think? And I'm stuck speaking for my entire 50% of the population is like, I don't know. I, it's a broken record with my viewers. I say, I don't speak for women. I speak for right. myself. You know, you, you can't have, you know, what do the black people think? What do the women think? What do the, you know, Latinx people think? You know, it's, it's too much pressure to put on a single person. And, mm -hmm. you know, you get into that idea of, definition of merit again when you define somebody as a diversity hire there's certainly an implication that they can't do the job yeah and i mean i i really try to not say that anyone at google is not qualified it's just that we are doing these practices mm -hmm. and so they have negative effects on everyone we really should address that you know mm -hmm. now you say in one of your recommendations, reconsidering any set of people if it's not diverse enough, but not showing that same scrutiny in the reverse direction. Mm -hmm. I found that an interesting thing, and I'd like to offer a rephrase if I could. Sure. That there are invisible forms of diversity. It's not reverse diversity, it's invisible diversity. So things you talked about, about the autism spectrum, about atypical mm -hmm. behaviors, about moral or political affiliation. Uh, mm -hmm. You could have made just as strong a biological argument for people are hardwired liberal or conservative. They can't right. help that. And so, but you can't see that. So you can't immediately go, this is diversity. So right. I, th I think I get what you were saying there, but I think it's less about thinking about a highway and more thinking about a round table that we need to incorporate into the Venn diagram other things that matter very much. I mean, I, mm -hmm. I have people who are on, they happen to be on the spectrum, but oh man, they will sit and do things that would bore me to tears, but they are amazing at it and they like it. Right. And so I'm going to put them somewhere where they can succeed. I'm not going to make them speak in public, you know, <laughs> but because I value what makes them different and make them special, they mm. feel valued. I get awesome work and we don't have this. What about diversity? It's diverse, you mm -hmm. know, it. So what, what do you, what do you think about that shift in perspective, adding a Z axis? for lack of a better term, so, sorry, Z, you guys are Z, uh, <laughs> adding a Z axis to the X, Y, you know, the line goes this, the line goes in a, in a diagonal. What about adding some depth to that, that we actually have to think in the third dimension when it comes to diversity? Yeah, and I definitely tried to touch on this mm -hmm. uh, when I said, you know, maybe we should break down uh, the Google Geist, which is the internal survey done every year. Oh, is that what it is? Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, by not just gender, but also some of these personality traits and really see how different people are um, experiencing Google, which, you know, maybe introverts are really hating it or something. Wait, they don't measure, and, they don't measure Myers-Briggs? Uh, no, not really. Really? Wow. No. <laughs> That's interesting. I say that as an INTJ female, because uh, <laughs> I find that really helpful. Like, yeah. 
I, at least know. so the INTP and INTJ people. So I'm INTP. There you go. They, they, they both very much That's like the Myers Briggs. I think it's because you know, it provides <laughs> some sort so of true. system to understand human behavior, right? But you're perceiving as opposed to judging, which explains why you're like, I don't want to criticize. You're like, I don't want to criticize. And my J kicks in and go, I do. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting that we're only one letter off each other. Mm -hmm. And I mean, again, that's really interesting because we'd seem if we line up, you know, the identity politics to be more different than alike. But on paper, if you take those out, we have a lot more in common in terms of the way we think than what separates us. Right. And yeah. I, I think that really speaks to what you're talking about. It's interesting that they're not using that because I found that very simple because in my misbegotten youth, I tended to neglect the emotional components of things because it's the right answer or the wrong answer. The shortest distance between two points is the best way to run a meeting. Mm -hmm. I had to learn to sort of let it meander more. Yeah. Which at first was like chewing off my arm because I wanted efficiencies it's mm -hmm. really interesting that they got into that so we're almost done in our very systematic deep dive into your document uh but this whole idea about demoralizing diversity this is right. when we really get into jonathan Haidt's work and what i kind of touched on before that it is almost impossible to demoralize any discussion and not demoralizes and make everybody sad d right, right. hyphen moralize take the emotional morality out of it mm -hmm. that contradicts hates pillars of decision making hypothesis that thing i talked about earlier that mm -hmm. you have an emotional response and then you come up with after the fact or my big fancy word post priority priori because i love i've studied emmanuel kant and damn it i want to use it <laughs> <laughs> um hate says we have to embrace moral decision making and see people who think differently than us as equal they're just wired differently mm -hmm. so uh, like yes yeah, so i mean I, I agree that there are definitely some morals that are sort of hardwired and the building blocks for other morals that we have. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I was more actually building on other people's work like uh, Rosen and Steven Pinker, okay. where they say that you know there are certain uh, issues that become moralized and they those issues actually change over time, which ones become moralized. That's very true. And, um, like one being, you know, child labor. Right. This is something that we feel very strongly against. Pederasty. But... Oh, yeah. what's that? Pederasty, the ancient Roman practice of um, sexual intimacy between an older man and a younger boy. Oh. <laughs> that yeah. was socially acceptable back in the day as something as a form of birth control, but it was painted as this coming of age thing. Nowadays, we're all like, re, 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 no. <laughs> no that's gross but you know to prove your point it morality does change over time mm -hmm. does it make more sense to attempt to repress morality or to really understand it for what it is that it is a changing thing it is not the unchanging standard for all time the way some orthodoxies maintain that it is right yeah i think seeing it not as some um, absolute and you know they're they're really doing things that encourage the moralization of diversity to an unhealthy degree right in an unhealthy way mm -hmm. okay i see what you're saying there now we demoralize diversity but then we stop alienating conservatives these right. two principles i know why you're laughing you know where i'm going these two principles seem on their surface to clash Either it's science, 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 fuck your feels, pardon my French, or liberalism is okay, conservatism is okay, moderates, moderates are okay, libertarians are okay. It's kind of one or the other. That might be your P and, and my J talking, but 
I'm sorry, I just talked about your pee. I didn't mean <laughs> to make you uncomfortable. That was a microaggression. But <laughs> but you see what I'm saying? Like, from a systems perspective, oh my God, James, I'm more systemically oriented than you. What's going on here? But you see what I mean? Uh, so, and some people have tried to point out that this was a uh, contradiction within my document, but you know, I'm not calling for you know, we need more conservatives necessarily, and we really should do some affirmative action for conservatives. Uh, it's really that we should stop alienating them. See. And stop making it so that it's not inclusive for different viewpoints. See, I would test everybody based on the righteous mind principles on Jonathan Hates, because I think there are a lot of people that are actually hardwired conservative that identify as liberal, but they're actually not. I think a lot of these regressive liberals, because the thing that regressive liberals have is a very high disgust trigger. You see mm -hmm. them describing things as sick or gross, a lot of things. And in the same way that the hippies of the 60s became the yuppies of the 80s, I suspect as these regressive liberals age, they're actually going to start identifying more and more and more as conservative because they are, they are exhibiting conservative traits, especially uh, yeah. on that disgust paradigm. So I think actually the science on this is a little biased. So a lot of the connections between disgust and conservatism actually came out of them trying to study right-wing authoritarians. Mm -hmm. So they really wanted to find people that might become Nazis and discourage mm -hmm. that. So they made all these tests for right-wing authoritativeness. But they so, never made tests for left-wing authoritativeness. So you're actually disagreeing with Jonathan Haidt that a, dis a high disgust or a low disgust threshold is an indicator of conservatism. You think it's an indicator of authoritarianism. Right. And there's some studies that support this view. Sure. I, I, I think it's undecided at this point. But I, I think you know, if you look at libertarian, which is really just anti-authoritative, that the and one highly of individualized predictor. maximum right. freedoms for maximum people we sacrifice some safety for freedom right like that is very much just i'm not disgusted by anything and so that that's how i identify like i of course i'm not you know hardcore libertarian but mm -hmm. i'm not disgusted by like anything i i've read through the righteous mind and all those things and it's like yeah you skewed so liberal was fine. yeah <laughs> see i I recognize that I do have that trigger for things. I, I go, that's me. Do I really have a reason to feel that way? It, it, you know, that sort of hinge of, wait, I'm feeling this. This may be my bias, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and it, it is possible that part of your, ch your, your issue at Google was the fact that you are very comfortable with uncomfortable things. And you ran yeah. up against a bunch of people that aren't like they they are less comfortable with those moral challenges. Mm -hmm. And that I, I mean, like you said, it's a form of it's a form of diversity, that type of thinking. Mm -hmm. Like there's no right or wrong there. It's just um, different. And uh, that. I'm going to jump ahead and wrap up because I've been gabbing at you a long time, but this idea of empathy. Right. And I, I want to try to reframe this as well because I was like, oh, <laughs> don't use that header. <laughs> and I shouldn't say yeah. don't, but I'm like, oh, the de de emphasize empathy. Now, the thing is, yeah, I so your, your, your headers, uh, sorry, I'm being INTJ again. Um, your headers are very provocative. And then the body of the paragraph is incredibly nuanced. You pack a lot of nuance into a single paragraph. Like, my God, you'd be an amazing opinion writer. Uh, maybe you missed your calling. Um, but you identify two types of empathy, mm. which is bang on, right? You talk about psych psychological safety mm -hmm. in another point. And... So it's sort of like, again, I'm trying to figure out where you're coming from saying we have to encourage psychological safety. 
And the general understanding is that that is through empathy, intentional dialogue, recognizing intents, which you also indicate prioritizing intention. But mm. that only comes through heaping boatloads of cognitive empathy. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the perspective taking element, when you mentioned effective empathy, I think what you were really going for was ecological validity. When you call out those anecdotes, that it's ecolog ecological validity, that everyday life references, which make people connect. That's what gives mm -hmm. anecdotes real power, but anecdotes are not scientific. Right. And yeah, I, I, the de-emphasize empathy was really too succinct. I, I was trying to just say, you know, de-emphasize emotional empathy for policy decisions. And so too often we just mention these anecdotes in our diversity programs. And then we use those anecdotes to justify these large scale policies, which mm. is like, judging which charity you should give money to based on how sad the little girl in the picture looks, you know? But that's what people do. I, I know, that's exactly what people do. I know this because I did fundraising. That, you you <laughs> nailed why people give money to charity. You can mm -hmm. cite statistics on them. I did epilepsy charity work, and we used to say, oh, wow, one in a hundred people have some form of seizure disorder. So that's a huge number like you mm -hmm. think that the sheer scope of that would normalize it but no what it did is make people tune out oh numbers act no <laughs> you tell them the single story of a little kid with emp with with epilepsy all of a sudden they throw money at you because it right. feels good and that d damn those you know E N F P S, you know, that, that do that feeling, that do that extroverted feeling decision making, but that is the majority of the population. So mm -hmm. I know it's ironic for me to be throwing population norms in your at, at you at this, but it is the reality that this is how the majority of people think, which makes it suck for people like you and I who don't approach issues that way. But we have to recognize once again we're abnormal. Right. You know. And I, I was really just trying to, you know, point out that cognitive bias that many right. people have. Well, maybe, maybe the way to go about it is that make sure the anecdotes you use are actually reflective of the science and right. not use the anecdote as the science, mm -hmm. if that makes any sense. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yay. We're getting so much done. And, you know, I wanted to, um, to end on this idea of prioritizing intention because because mm -hmm. we already talked to death about unconscious bias training and science and i made a joke about microaggressions so i think you understand how i feel on that <laughs> issue i mean the more i'm not even going to hit you with that because the more studies have been done on microaggressions the more there's a weakening of support for the theory right like i it's undeniable that the better the studies get the less replication of my, I mean, you know what I'm talking about, right? Like mm -hmm. a few really solid studies have come out in the last few years that indication indicate that microaggression theory is just bunk. It, mm -hmm. it actually isn't an accurate indicator of comfort. You know, it, it, it's almost like we're hypersensitizing people to these things by making right. it carry a greater charge. But you talk about, and this this is the tragedy in the traditional sense of a preventable disaster. If they had listened to one thing you said, and it was this one thing, this would have been handled very differently. And it's prioritized intention. Right. Because I think if the last hour and a half has shown anything, that your intentions are actually good. I mean, mm -hmm. you just took an hour and a half long grilling from me like a pro, you know, like you, you, you dealt with some pretty tough questions. And mm -hmm. the thing I am struggling to understand about your story is mm -hmm. why intent in this issue, you know, you are the poster boy for intent not mattering. <laughs> like, 
-hmm. the irony is killing me. You know, I'm like systems, 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 but, 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 but it's there, right? Mm -hmm. You were so careful to state your intention. You were so careful to frame what you said in, I am trying to help. And right. you weren't judged based on that intention at all. And I mean, the profound lack of cognitive empathy involved in firing you with a phone <laughs> is, uh, you know, management 101 says you don't do that. That's just somebody mm -hmm. trying to avoid a face to face conflict, right? Yeah. Um, that showed absolutely no consideration for you as a human being. And yeah. that's why I was like, empathy, no, you needed more empathy. Stop arguing against your interests, <laughs> J, 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 right? But that intention, as somebody who is probably still processing a large group of people and management and your employer really not caring about your intention, you know, I think this is the number one thing we could do today to actually improve these diversity issues. How mm -hmm. do we prioritize intention? You indicated why we should. I know I'm being a pain in the ass INTJ about this again, but systems, how do we prioritize intention? Yeah, I, that's hard to do for sure. I think Maybe that's your next document. Take, <laughs> yeah, taking some of the emotions out of it definitely okay. helps. So being aware of that post priori, sort of that you have an emotional response and framing your post priori logic for that response. Right. With and, the correct framework. And you know, if you look at how people deal with a lot of these pol political uh, situations is that they'll read into it as, okay, everyone views the world the same, Therefore, mm -hmm. uh, if they say something different than what I believe, then they either are misinformed or they're a bigot. Right. And so a lot of people just assume that I was a sexist and that was my intention. Interesting. So that framework, but because of, let's face it, because of the way the media framed it, the mainstream media yeah. framed it relatively badly. Um, is that a vacuum cleaner? <laughs> Uh, um, yeah, there's some lawnmower outside or something. Oh, it's a lawnmower. Ah, okay. <laughs> uh, but because of the way the media framed it, yeah, that's exactly how people interpreted it. I wonder, because to me, the reason you stayed intent is to reduce the emotional defensiveness barrier. Mm. And you don't have to take the emotions out of it cognitively it's done passively by remembering the person's intent right you know it it does frame your words very differently when i'm like yeah but he said his intention was to help you know playing devil's devil's advocate is a very important part of the product development process Mm -hmm. You know, you, you have to be free to say things like just throwing it out there, you know, if you're coming from a good place. Right. What I'm wondering is, and I know you probably don't know because they didn't allow you that exit conversation, which is what's, it's a, it's a frustrating missing piece of this. Yeah. I don't understand why because when i made the original video on this i would have said if i were a manager what i would have done is done a workshop and you're there and any female employee of google is there and they just have at it moderated of course so nobody goes off the mm -hmm. deep end but you know somebody there to to mo moderate the emotional response but I feel so much more valued as an employee when I am allowed to give my opinions for myself in context than to have the dialogue shut down because people are trying to protect the women's. Right. And yeah. that's why I feel like Google did the exact wrong thing. Mm -hmm. There was no conversation. A male CEO 
decided for all the women at Google that this was the right way to go about it based on a very loud and vocal minority opinion. Mm -hmm. This seems like a management problem. Right. And just the incentive structure is all wrong where, you know, this very loud uh, minority of people can really just control things by complaining so uh, loudly. I think one of the reasons they didn't do something as open as you're suggesting is mm -hmm. they really felt like even discussing these issues was harmful to people. Because they don't know how. Yeah, maybe. I mean, we just had an hour and 45 minute long conversation about everything you wrote about. There was back and forth. There was point and counterpoint. It was fun mm -hmm. for me. You're probably pretty <laughs> tired, but I enjoyed it. Um, the reason I wanted to do this is precisely to show it can be done. And, right. you know, I, I, I would like to see people try to replicate this process just because, you know what, I give you real credit. When I told you my experiences with some of these views you obviously believe, but how they were used for evil instead of good, the first thing out of your mouth was, wow, that's really bad that that happened to you. Like, mm -hmm. that was a really powerful, positive, empathic response. And I, I'm wondering if because of those sort of real male role models, you don't give yourself enough credit for what an important skill that is that you're able to do that. You know, yeah, like not everybody can do that. Mm -hmm. Not, you know, you, you go on the internet, it's like, suck it up. Your response was compassionate, you know, mm -hmm. and that leads to, okay, you gave me that. I can give you this. Like, I know where you're coming from because it's not just Evo psych. It's not just evolutionary biology. It's anthropology, sociology, psychology, you know, and various fields have various replication problems they're all a piece. Mm -hmm. And I, I, you know, I, I hope that's what people take from this. And, and I hope that, you know, you, you go on to something else and that sort of appreciates your willingness to speak truth to power. I mean, wrong or right. Yeah. Anybody who's trying to offer solutions, like, when you say the incentives are all wrong, yeah, the incentives sure are all wrong because you didn't just go, well, this is a problem and you're wrong. You actually attempted to find solutions. Right. And that's a starting point. Like, you know, what, what do you, and I know you probably don't have an answer for this, but I have to do the human interest part. Something I have to work on being essentially a Vulcan. Um, what's next for you? Where do you go that you don't just become the face of a scandal, that you actually get to use the stuff you're good at to find a group of people that are not exploiting you for a political uh, agenda, which I think too much mm -hmm. of that has happened so far, you know? Um, I worry for you because you were the fastest yes I've ever had in an interview. You know, it was just like, yeah, okay, sure. You didn't ask me who I was. You didn't ask what it was about. You didn't ask for parameters. You know, I have a laundry list. I have a freaking writer when I agree to an interview. You're just like, yeah, okay, sure. <laughs> and yeah. that babe in the woods element, and that's not an insult. I find it very charming. But it also yeah. triggers a protective instinct in me. And... Mm -hmm. I, I want to figure out how to show the awesome, amazing James Damore that I just talked to for going on two hours and not this caricature of James Damore that we see in the mainstream media. How do we make that happen? How do we bring you back to being a fully formed human being? And yeah, I'm not really sure. And I'm uncomfortable with all this feely <laughs> stuff. I apologize. But yeah. How do we do this? I, it's really hard to change narratives. I'm not sure exactly how to right now. Okay, so how do we help think, you survive the narrative? What do you need right now? Uh, <laughs> Putting you on the spot, I know, vulnerability. <laughs> yeah, if, it's also, I, I'm very bad at asking for help, so I, I, I really don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm bad too. That's, that's why uh, I... Uh, 
um, that's the I. <laughs> um, hmm. What do you need right now? Like, I, I know you're doing a lot of media and that's really exciting, hmm. but for your supporters, uh, we're big on this channel about channeling support in positive ways. And I think there's a lot of culture war being injected mm. into your situation. And I really get the sense that that's the last thing you want. It, it seems to yeah. fly completely in the face of what you wrote and what principles are important to you. So how does someone who supports you support you effectively? Yeah, I think maybe fighting for some of the same principles that I was, you know, trying to bring a moderate voice to a lot of these issues and, you know, continuing a lot of Jonathan Haidt's work on how we can bridge the divide between people. I think that that's really what I want. And one of the things that I fear is that some of this may have increased the polarization, which is really what I don't want. Yeah. Have you read any Dan Ariely? A little bit, yeah. Predictably irrational? Uh, I, I, I like took his courses on Coursera or something, but yeah, I, no. I haven't read the books. Actually read his book. Oh, because really? it, it might actually give you, well, this is so nerdy, but <laughs> it might actually give some insight into what's happening to you, how people um, react in ways that aren't logical, but yeah. replicate. You know, the, the idea of people hate the idea of closing a door. So, because what you basically did mm -hmm. is you advocated, well, well, this door is not getting us anywhere. It's unproductive. So close that door so we can go through the other door, like close this off so we can explore something that works. Mm -hmm. And Ariely's work basically um, implies that people would rather melt their face off with a blowtorch than close a door. <laughs> it's really interesting. He, he does these little computer models where the door gets slower and slower and slower, uh, smaller and smaller and smaller, sorry. And even though cognitively they recognize that it is in their best interest to just keep clicking the bigger door, they can't yeah. stand for that option B to disappear. <laughs> yeah, I, I can definitely see that yeah. in the case. <laughs> that, that you're advocating for a very practical pruning of policy. Mm -hmm. And you got this strong emotional response based on, I think, an inability to admit that what they're doing isn't working because their and their PR isn't even based on what they're doing internally. Nobody really knows what they're doing internally. What jumps yeah. out at me every year is those piss poor improvement numbers. You know, <laughs> like one one percent. Yeah. So so reading so you want people to read the righteous mind, essentially. Yeah, when, that'd be a start. <laughs> yeah, when which I recommend. It's one of my recommended books. Uh, actually recommended to me by a former preacher. That mm. uh, the righteous mind was recommended. Uh, but when people are engaging on social media or in person or anything like that with people and they're supporters of yours, how do you want them to conduct themselves? Uh, I think, yeah. You know, just being nice or at least just not attacking people would right. be a start. So keep the emotion uh, I, out of it. Yeah. And I guess being upfront about what you value is sometimes useful in diffusing some of these heated debates. But yeah, it's definitely hard to have useful conversations on something like Twitter. Yeah. Except that's how I got a hold of you. So I really like Twitter right now. <laughs> James, thank you so much. We got so much James Damore thinking face in, uh, in this interview, which I think is a testament to, you know, you as a, as a person and you as an intellectual. I, I really am pulling for you. I, I hope this, this works out in some way. I hope that in a small way, people can get a better sense of you through this mm -hmm. piece. Um, so thank you for coming on. Yeah, thanks a lot.